The last two weeks, we have been looking at the meeting that occurred between Elizabeth and the Blessed Virgin Mary, when the latter had just received news from the angel Gabriel, unheard of news, unlooked for news, news that would change her life and the life of her nation and the life of the entire world. The first week, we considered the greeting that she received from Elizabeth and from the child that was in Elizabeth's womb, who would be John the Baptist. Last week, we considered the first half of the Magnificat, the song of praise that burst from Mary's lips as she heard this confirmation of the angel's amazing message. My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he has looked on the humble estate of his servant. For behold, from now on, all generations will call me blessed, for he who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name." And his mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. Tonight we turn our attention to the second half of the Magnificat. In these verses we see last week's theme continue. The Almighty exercises his power to exalt the humble believer. And the believer, showing true humility, responds by exalting the Almighty. Saying, not by my power, O Lord. The Mighty One has done great things for me. I Can't take credit for that. But this is is paired now with a new element. Listen. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the mighty from their thrones and has exalted those of humble estate. He has filled the hungry with good things. And the rich he has sent away empty. There's a negative element added now. This jumps out at me whenever I sing the Magnificat. God isn't treating everyone the same here. He's not blessing everybody. And the people that he's bringing down are not said to be wicked oppressors, particularly evil, deserving of this kind of treatment. They're just said to be strong and wealthy. The worst thing that's said about them, actually, is that they're proud. And you know, if you're that successful, you're going to be a little bit proud about it. You're human. You're a sinner. Why is this part of Mary's song? And notice she's not just mentioning the humiliation as a fact. This is something God also does. She is praising him for it. Praising him for bringing down the mighty just the same as she's praising him for raising up the lowly. If we wanted to attempt a Marxist interpretation, say, that would be pretty easy to a point. This is class warfare, right? The fat cats have had their day. You say there's no evidence that they were oppressive? Well, they were rich. That's all the evidence you need. The class that has the power will use that power to hold on to that power. They will hold on to their privilege, and they will step on the lower classes as much as they need to in order to do so. Whether it's the hard power of prisons and armed police, or whether it's the soft power of religion and cultural morality. This is class struggle 101. Mary is excited because this is changing now, and the poor are getting their turn. And she's a little bit gleeful that now the tables are going to be turned. Let's see how you like poverty now. But hold on. Is that really all there is? God is replacing one group of oppressors with another? Mary's going to become a duchess now and look down her nose at the former governor of Nazareth as he weeds her flower bed? That's not the Marxist dream. That's just business as usual. The classes are supposed to wither away. Reasons for strife and oppression are supposed to disappear and everything that we know be replaced by some harmonious brotherhood of man. Mary, don't exalt the fall of the mighty. And tell those future generations not to call you blessed. You're just perpetuating the cycle. I'll take off my Marxist cap now. If that was the way to understand our passage, then Mary would have missed the point. And Hannah, in our Old Testament reading, would have missed it worse. She, too, is celebrating a divinely granted son. One that she had prayed for after years of barrenness. So it's not as miraculous as a virgin birth, but it's the same kind of thing. And what does she say? Among other things, in her prayer that we read, or her song of praise that we read, 
The bows of the mighty are broken, but the feeble bind on strength. Those who were full have hired themselves out for bread, but those who were hungry have ceased to hunger. The barren has borne seven, but she who has many children is forlorn. Does this sound a little petty? Vengeful? Misplaced vengeance at that, because a barren woman doesn't have any just complaint against a woman who happens to have a lot of children. That's just jealousy talking. Why is God being praised for this leveling? Does he approve of this kind of attitude? Well, he doesn't. He doesn't approve of pride in any of its forms, the lofty kind or the petty kind. And that's the point. If Hannah was gloating a little bit when she sang that song, then God dealt with her on that, I am sure, and she had to be forgiven for that. But her inspired point, which is also Mary's point, still stands. The reason this is written for us in Holy Scripture is to tell us that God disposes of human affairs. All power and wealth and success, all significance of any kind, comes from him and not from our own doings. It is not a fitting subject, any of it, for self-satisfaction. No matter how restrained you are about that self-satisfaction. Let's continue with Hannah's song for another few stanzas. The Lord kills and brings to life. He brings down to Sheol and raises up. The Lord makes poor and makes rich. He brings low and he exalts. He does all of those things. What do you have that you do not receive? And if you received it, why do you boast as if you did not receive it? Pride is a fungus that grows on gratitude and eventually replaces it. And this is why God doesn't just limit himself to the divine philanthropy of exalting the humble and filling the hungry with good things. But he also brings down the mighty from their thrones and he sends the rich away empty. And it's fitting to praise him for both of these things because he is the only one who is exalted in himself. He is the only one who is rich and full in himself. He is complete without us. We are nothing without him. And if we were not sinners, we would not be such fools as to swagger when we have success, to take credit for our blessings, or eventually to abuse our influence in order to hold on to them. Nor would we sulk and envy, on the other hand, when we find ourselves lowly and poor. Instead, we would fear, love, and trust in God above all things, giving him credit for all of our blessings and trusting in him for all the things that we need, as the first commandment tells us. If we did that, we would not deserve to be brought low. We would wait patiently on the Lord and he would raise us up. As things are, however, it is as much a part of God's glory to bring down the proud as it is to lift up the humble. His mercy is on those who fear him. To fear him is to be humble before him. To believe that he will raise us up despite our sins in remembrance of his mercy as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and to his offspring forever. And those of us who live in 21st century America, comparing ourselves to other 21st century Americans might not realize it, but we are actually, historically speaking, we are wealthy. We have an amazing degree of prosperity and self-determination. We especially must always give thanks and praise to God, as Mary shows us, because we don't realize how proud we are, how spoiled we must humble ourselves before him in thanksgiving and in service and in the confession of our sins and pleas for his mercy because if we think we're full, we will be sent empty away. If we think we are something, we will be proven to be nothing. And How wonderful it is then that our exalted Lord, the creator of the earth and stars, when he chose to work a magnificent deliverance for our salvation, employed such lowly means himself, 
He came down as a baby, as a fetus in the womb of a simple maid who had no particular titles, no particular honors paid to her at that time. And the honors that would be paid to her for the rest of time would be entirely because of him. He came in that very humble way, instead of as a shining hero down from heaven to step on the necks of his enemies. He came to suffer. He came to all appearances to be defeated by some of those proud men who didn't want to be pulled down from their thrones and were willing to do whatever it took to make sure that they weren't. And in so doing, he taught us that the highest, the most exalted, the most godlike thing that we can aspire to is humility. To be low is human. You are anyway. That's no virtue. That's not special. To confess it and to believe in the God who exalts the lowly, to believe in the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who sees all our sins forgiven in the work of his Son and raises us up when he raises him up. That is divine. That is the example of Jesus Christ, and that is what he enables us to do through faith. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. He is the source of your life in Christ Jesus, whom God made our wisdom and our righteousness and sanctification and redemption. Therefore, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. In the name of Jesus. Amen.